Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And Jesus is that light of life. So, this is going to be, I don't know what part, but symbolism in the Bible. And uh, we're going to study horn, H-O-R-N. Isn't it funny uh, when you uh, in your car and you're at a red light and it turns green and the guy in front of you doesn't want to move, what do you do? You blow the horn, right? Say, get moving, you dummy. Pay attention. Well, horns have... A number of meanings in the Bible horns can a horn or horns can mean symbolize power or government or rulership it could also was also used by the Prophets or seers, originally seers were called, uh, before they were called prophets, they were called seers, and they would anoint rulers with oil, olive oil. Now, did you know that olive oil, you could put it in a lamp with a wick and it'll burn, give you light. What is Jesus? He's the light of life. So oil was, olive oil was representative of the Holy Spirit, and we'll go more into that in a, during the study. I have a feeling this is going to be a at least a two-part study. But a horn also can be called for salvation. Oh yeah. Now they in the Hebrew, if I'm memory's correct. When they would blow the ram's horn, they called that the shofar. Modern day usage would be a trumpet or the trump. Uh, when you blow it, it's the trump, not Donald. He's the trump of the other god. But uh, it would make a noise. It could be a warning of some sort. Perhaps you're in a walled city and you see the enemy coming. You're the watchman on the wall. You're supposed to blow the trumpet. Warn the city. Danger, Will Robinson. Danger. And if you remember that, you're old. But it could also be a call to action. Sort of like on Sunday when the church bells are ringing and they're telling you, hey, uh, services are getting ready. Well, God, during the time of Moses, when he was supposed to go up to, I believe, Mount Sinai, or was it Mount Horeb? I'm, I'll have to look it up. But they would blow the horn and let everybody know, come to the mount. And, um, and that's what they would do. They'd blow the horn. But today we call it a trumpet. You know, they don't use ram's horns too much anymore. There's still a few people that do, but uh, now they make them out of metal. So one thing that I've really, really liked about the King James Bible, and some some of us call it the law of first usage if you look up a word that you're doing a study on or you're not sure of exactly what it means usually the first time it appears in the bible if you look it up in a concordance or on an online bible lookup like the blue letter bible or the king james bible online usually the first time it appears when you read it in the context, it'll give you a good idea of 
the meaning of the word and how it's used. And isn't it funny? The King James Bible Online, uh, they got a commentary where you can leave comments and ask questions and what have you. Isn't it funny? Chaplain Bob Walker was deleted at least twice for quoting Jesus. Uh, concerning the J word, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah, quoting Jesus, even on a supposedly Christian site, can get you banned. Boy, I'll tell you, it's, it's really, state of affairs is sad. So, makes you wonder about the administrators you know i honestly i think a lot of these sites are set up so that the antichrist devils they're logging in who we are oh this guy he's he's on a bible site well where where does he live what's his name you know i think they're uh logging our names and uh taking names and addresses and for when the time comes but that's my guess because boy i'll tell you what if the king james bible online people are real christians well they're going to have a lot to answer for about deleting deleting people that quote jesus boy i'll tell you what all right so a little bit of background information um uh, Exodus. When Israel was in Egypt, Moses was called of the Lord to lead Egypt, uh, lead Israel out of Egypt. Egypt is never talked about nicely in the Bible, to my knowledge. And um, God wanted to get not only take Israel out of Egypt, but to take Egypt out of Israel. Yeah, their hearts were in Egypt. What was that saying? Um, that somebody said during the time of Rome, they said, if you send your kids to Caesar, don't be surprised when they come back as Romans. And yeah. Uh, public school app uh, application, anyone? Yeah, when you send your kids to public school and they teach them, teach them, everything but the Bible and evolution and everything else. And you spend 12 years and they graduate from high school and then you send them to college for four years. And, you know, at the end of 16 years, and you wonder why your kids don't believe the Bible. Oh, Dad, that's just a bunch of fairy tales. Like when you told me about Santa Claus, which was a lie. And you told me about the tooth fairy, which was a lie. You know, Jesus is just another one of those, you know dad which is why i'm against telling kids about satan satan claws yeah satan's claws and here it is december 8th 2022 and uh what is it jeremiah chapter i think it's jeremiah chapter 10 about the tree i think it's jeremiah 10 yep uh, read Jeremiah chapter 10. Why don't you pause right now? Read Jeremiah chapter 10. I've done a Bible study on it, at least one. And uh, ask yourself what time of the year people cut down a tree and decorate it. Deck it. You know, deck the halls with boughs of holly. Fa la 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 la. Yeah, deck means decorate. That's where you get the word decorate from. What time of the year do people cut down a tree and decorate it? Give you a hint. Uh, December. Yeah, wow. I never would have guessed, Chaplain Bob. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then God says not to do it. But, hey, I'm, I'm just the messenger, you know. And uh, if you come over to my house, you, you won't see a tree. So, God says not to do something. It's a good idea not to do it. God says to do something. Good idea to do it. What can I tell you? So, all right. In Exodus, though, God takes Israel out of Egypt. 
and they bring their livestock. Now in the Bible, wealth was livestock. You know, cattle. Uh, you got two types of cattle. You got beef cattle. You know, you want a prime rib steak. And uh, you got milk cattle, dairy cattle. Uh, believe it or not, there's two different kinds. And um, so if you had cattle, you had meat, you had milk. Uh, that was wealth, you know, but also beasts of burdens, whether it was a horse or a donkey or, you know, you know, and it could be, you could have goats or whatever, chickens, you know. But uh, land, and the Bible strongly teaches private property, absolutely teaches that. Of course, in communism, the people controlling the government, they want to control all the land. They want to control everything and make your life as miserable as possible before they end it. Yeah. So, livestock, land, gold, and silver. And believe it or not, the definition of a dollar was one ounce of 90% silver. That is the actual legal definition of a dollar. And last I looked, I haven't had any dollars in my pocket since the 60s. Yeah. But also gold. Do you know that in the 1920s, you could have a $20 gold piece and it was made out of gold. It was one ounce of gold. I'm not sure what the percentage of the content was. It might have been 90%, but if you had... Um, 25 of them, 25 20, $20 pieces, maybe 30 $20 pieces, you could have bought a brand new Ford. What is it, Model T, Model A, I forget. They are about five, $600 back then. If you had about $8,000, you could have bought a brand new house. A modest house. You know, nothing fancy. Uh, nothing like Donald Trump lives in. And I'm not picking on Donald Trump. But I'm just saying. But that's what wealth was. And by the way, for you people in the UK, a pound sterling was 12 troy ounces of sterling silver, which I believe is 99.99% silver. Do you... Uh, a a pound, the legal definition of a pound is not a piece of paper with a picture of the queen on it or that idiot that they've got who's king now, whatever. So, and uh, if you think I'm insulting your political leaders, uh, join the club. So, of course, being an American... And looking at Canada and Australia and UK and the EU, uh, we're all in the same boat. And it seems like it's the Titanic and we're heading towards the iceberg at full speed. So, yeah. Uh, all right. So, all right. Now, let's take a look at. Exodus 19. That's going to be our introductory verse. No, I'm sorry. What am I doing? Uh, we're going to go to Exodus 21. Forgive me, I'm getting old. You know, Alzheimer's setting in, I guess. I don't know. All right. Uh, Exodus 21. We're going to read 20, uh, verse 28. If an ox gore a man or a woman that they die, 
Then the ox shall surely be stoned. And we're not going to give that ox CBD. No. No, we're going to kill it. We're not going to get it stoned. And his flesh shall not be eaten. But the owner of the ox shall be quit. I'm guessing that the owner is acquitted. Have you ever heard of the, you know, being acquitted? You're arrested, charged with a crime, and then the jury acquits you. It means you're found basically non, not guilty. What does it mean if an ox gores somebody? Well, in Spain, they've got this really stupid tradition they do every year. It's called the running of the bulls. They close down a an area in the city and they release some bulls and then they run in front of the bulls and it seems like every year somebody gets gored you know the bull takes his horn and runs somebody through and they find this entertaining uh, personally I think it's the most stupid thing I've ever heard in my life well one of one of I should say but yeah Having an, uh, a one-ton animal sticking his horn through your stomach, you know, sticking you in the back and coming out your stomach, the front, uh, people die. I mean, come on. Sometimes you might only go to the hospital for three months. But, uh, but the book of Leviticus is a book of law that we used to teach in our Bible colleges here in the United States, like Harvard and Yale, Bible colleges. They were Bible colleges. Now Harvard has classes on anal sex. Yeah, as an elective. Uh, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Isaiah 14, right? So, so if the ox killed somebody with its horns, you kill the ox, his flesh shall not be eaten. Now, why is that? This is Bob's opinion, my guess. I'm wondering if a devil possessed the ox to do this. I'm kind of guessing. Remember when the man was at the tombs and Jesus uh went there and asked the man his name and he says my name is legion for we are many and the guy was cutting himself with the stones and what have you and yeah and then the devil said hey uh if you're gonna cast us out how about casting us out in that herd of swine and jesus said go what did they do they went into the swine and the swine is like i don't want to be demon possessed possessed of devils and they ran off the cliff and drowned themselves they committed suicide yeah maybe that's why the flesh should not be eaten i'm not sure now you remember in the new testament uh, about not eating the flesh of idols of of meat sacrificed unto idols all right, that little tidbit is in Acts 15, 29. Um, the Christians were wondering, do we need to keep the law of Moses? And there were people saying, oh, well, you know, you got to be circumcised and you got to keep the Sabbath and you got to do this. If you're going to be saved, you got to do this. But what did the apostles say? Well, in Acts 15, 29, they said that ye abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood. Don't be drinking blood. That's what the devil's kids do. And from things strangled and from fornication, from which if ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well, fare ye well. So they did not want us eating meats that were sacrificed or offered to idols or devils. All right. So that's why I'm uh, guessing that um, 
you wouldn't eat if you, you know, if a bull killed somebody with their horn, you would kill the bull and you would not eat the bull. And that is my guess. But the owner of the bull would be guiltless because, you know, he didn't know. Verse 29, but, but, if the ox were wont to push with his horn in time past, in other words, if this owner of this animal, this beast, knew that this thing was dangerous and had proven himself proven itself dangerous in times past and it hath been testified to his owner and he hath not kept him in but that he hath killed a man or a woman the ox shall be stoned and his owner also shall be put to death so these people that have these pit bulls and I got nothing against pit bulls per se I mean uh, family members had two of them and they were like the sweetest things in the world. You know, last time I went over to this person's house, the their pit bull laid right next to me on the couch and put his head on my lap and just let me rub his belly or whatever. So, yeah, he's a big baby, really. But some of them, you know, they, they treat them rough so that they fight. But if somebody knows that their pit bull is a danger and has bitten somebody in the past they're supposed to kill the thing period oh it, it bit somebody kill it oh don't kill my dog i'll keep him in and they put him and the thing gets out again and kills a little kid and it's happened well you're supposed to kill the pit bull and the owner and i'll tell you what uh, if people followed the Bible law, it'd be a much better world. Yeah. Nothing in the Bible about building prisons for murderers. But you couldn't kill them. Uh, you, you, you shouldn't execute a murderer without two or three witnesses. None of this, oh, DNA evidence or police planting evidence. And they do, by the way. Absolutely. So, what is a horn for an animal it's protection right i mean um lions like um what is it wildebeest they're like an ox they got horns lions don't want to mess with them horns rhinos rhinoceroses they got horn and lions don't want to mess with them either Elephants, they got tusks. I don't know if that's technically a horn, but you know, you get the idea. Goats have got horns. So do rams, which is what a male sheep, right? Or you're thinking a Dodge truck, right? Yeah. But uh, they would blow the ram's horn, the shofar. So, all right, so that is the first time that a horn is found in scripture it's on an animal it's for protection uh, for the animal and uh, you got predators and you got prey and sometimes prey has got uh, teeth so to speak all right let's go to joshua chapter six now, Joshua, believe it or not, I believe is the correct pronunciation of what the Hebrew roots people try to deceive us with, that Yeshua stuff. I think it's Joshua. And from what I understand, it's Hebrew and it means salvation. Who was Joshua? Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, Moses brought Israel out of Egypt. And then he got old and he died. And Joshua took over. The Lord wanted Joshua to take over for Moses. And they went into the land of Canaan and fought wars against the 
Canaanites. And uh, all these people who think that the Canaanites have an offer of salvation, well, <laughs> God didn't say, go into Canaan and preach to them and tell them about the love of Jesus because I love everybody. No, God told Israel to go in and kill them all. Yeah. Why didn't God say, go in there and preach to them and tell them I love them and give them the Ten Commandments and tell them to live right? No. He said, go kill them all. And then you talk about this stuff and people say, man, you're talking about race. Well, argue with God. Don't argue with me. I'm just, I'm just the Bible teacher. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. God didn't like the Canaanites. God didn't like the Philistines, of which many of which were giants, like the Goliath. God didn't tell David to go tell Goliath about the love of Jesus. No. David took a stone and put it into his forehead. So, Joshua 6, we're going to talk about the fall of the walls of Jericho. Joshua 6, 1. Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. So the walls are, and the gates are closed solid. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into thine hand Jericho and the king thereof, and the mighty men of valor. So Jericho's got a king, and mighty men, uh, mighty men in their army. And ye shall compass the city. Uh, what is a compass? You know, they use that to find direction. You know, 360 degrees, a circle. And ye shall compass the city, all ye men of war, and go round about the city once. Thus shalt thou do six days. And seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets seven trumpets of ram's horns what happens you blow the horn it makes the trump sound right not donald seven trumpets of ram's horns and the seventh day ye shall compass the city seven times and the priest shall blow with the trumpets do, do, do. and it shall come to pass that when they shall make a long blast a long blast with the ram's horn and when ye hear the sound of the trumpet all the people shall shout with a great shout and the wall of the city shall fall down flat and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. Now, guess what's on the wall? Soldiers are on the wall. Yeah. Because, you know, it's not a thin wall. It's going to be a thick wall. And you're going to be able to walk on that wall. There's going to be soldiers everywhere on the wall. That's where you want your soldiers, on the wall. So that when your enemy comes and tries to climb the wall, your soldiers are there to throw spears and bows and arrows and shoot arrows down at them and throw rocks or whatever they do, you know. Well, these walls are going to fall down flat. And I don't think they just went straight down. I think they leaned and then just fell over, like when you chop down a tree. That's my guess. What happens to all the soldiers that's on the wall guarding the city? Um, wow, that's a good question, Chaplain Bob. Well, they probably, you know, how, how, how tall is the wall? 20 foot, 30 foot, 40 foot? I don't know. But they're going to have, they're going to fall down. And I'll guarantee you that soldier is not going to feel like fighting uh, if he survives the fall. So, yeah. So the city, the walls fell down. Israel went in, they killed all the soldiers, and they wiped out 
pretty much everybody, to my knowledge. So if you want to pause right here and read about it, you know, you can read about it. Now, think about this. Um, what happens during the tribulation in the book of Revelation? You got the seven trumps. The seven trumpets are blown. The seven trumps. And the Bible claims, says that we are changed in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. Well, in Revelation, the last book of the Bible, there's seven trumps, and the seventh one is the last one and is at the end of the tribulation. So when you hear the pre-trib rapture people telling you that we're raptured out of here before the tribulation, you're listening to a false prophet. Whether they're doing it intentionally or because they're deceived because they listen to a false prophet, either way, they're deceived and well, I can't, you know, I can't do much about it. So, but the last trump is at the end of the tribulation. And when the last trump's blown, that's when Christ returns. Boy, we could, I could make a Bible study out of just that. Oh, you don't believe me. Well, turn to 1 Thessalonians 4.16. This is Paul, you know, I know some people have a hard time with Paul and, I, you know, there's some things I can understand, you know, but to throw away Paul's writings, I mean, you got to throw away the book of Acts, the entire book of Acts, because the book of Acts tells you of Paul's conversion. And then you got to believe that the Holy Spirit failed to warn the apostles in the book of Acts that Paul was a false apostle. Did God fail to warn the other 11 apostles that Paul was a fake? I mean, really? Why would God not warn them if he was a fake? Why? So you got to throw away, you'd have to throw away the book of Acts. You have to believe that God failed to warn the other 11 that Paul was a fraud. You got to throw away all of Paul's writings, of course. So what's left? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, James, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, and the book of Revelation. And that's the, old, that's the entire New Testament. If you throw away Paul, that's it. But let's read 1 Thessalonians 4.16, Paul's writings. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Isn't that what we just read in Joshua? They blew the horn and the people shouted. Oh, yeah. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. There's that secret rapture. There's always a secret rapture when people are shouting, right? with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump, the trumpet, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Huh. Okay. How about 1 Corinthians 15, 52? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, See, there's seven trumps in the book of Revelation. The seventh one is the last one. Not, not the first one, the last one. At the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. There you go. See, the book of Revelation is mirrored in the book of Joshua, if you ask me. You know, they go around the city, they blow the horn, everybody shouts, boom, falls down, the city's wiped out. Can we tie that into Revelation? Absolutely. 
But uh, the Lord's going to come down from heaven with a shout, and the earth's going to be destroyed. Oh, yeah. All the sinners, wicked people, wiped out. It's going to happen, people. You know, the thing is, if you've never read the Old Testament, all the symbolism, well, the great majority of the symbolism comes for the New Testament, comes from the Old Testament. If you've never read it, it ain't going to make no sense. The book of Revelation draws almost all of its symbolism from the rest of the Bible. Seriously. I've had people say, oh, I'm a New Testament Christian, and I just read the New Testament because I don't need those Old Testament laws. That's for the Jews. But I don't understand the book of Revelation. Well, of course not, because all the symbolism comes from the Old Testament. Dude, girl, whatever, you know. Yeah. So, so it's going to be just like in Joshua 6. But instead of just the city, it's going to be the whole world. All right, so. Uh, let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 1. Uh, verse one. Samuel was a prophet of the Lord. All right, let's go to Samuel chapter 2. Um, there was a woman named Hannah. And she was barren and wanted a child. And uh, the Lord, uh, you could read about it in 1 Samuel chapter 1. And then in chapter 2, the Lord grants her petition for a son. And she dedicates a son to the service of the Lord. And his name is Samuel, which the chapter is named after. And uh, Samuel served he was a priest and he served king david yeah so let's uh let's take a look first samuel chapter two you know the old testament is so important it's our book it's not the book of the antichrist that are over in the middle east that's only window dressing that's identity theft it really is. It's the greatest identity theft in the history of mankind. You know, three things always go together. Um, among the, for example, the Baptist, the Zionists, Zionism. Uh, they want to take God's kingdom and turn it into an earthly kingdom so that the, their Messiah, the Antichrist, can rule. That's what Zionism is. Um, the pre-trib rapture. Which the pre-trib rapture always follows, or vice versa, uh, Zionism. Zionism, the pre-trib rapture, and what they call dispensational theology. And I don't like using that stuff. Yeah, I went to Bible college, but I don't like using those kind of words. Basically, what they do is they chop the Bible up into periods of time. And they said, oh, okay, this period of time applies to everybody. This period of time applies only to the Jews. This period of time applies to uh, the church. And by the time they get through with it, um, you're all messed up. I mean, it's just, you know... The whole Bible belongs to God's people, the church, not the Antichrists that are over in the Middle East. No. But what they do is, even if you find something that prove, in the Bible that clearly proves them wrong, a, a verse, they'll tell you, oh, well, that, that's in the wrong dispensation. It, it doesn't apply to us. That applied to them back then, but not now. To me, there's only two dispensations, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And dispensation comes from the word dispense, which means to give something, like a, a soap dispenser. You know, you go into the, 
the, the washroom in a restaurant and you wash your hands, you put your hands under the soap dispenser, you get soap, right? It dispenses soap. It gives you soap. Well, what did, what did Moses, what was Moses given? What did Moses give the children of Israel? The law. What did Christ give us? Grace. What do you want? Law or grace? There's only two dispensations in the Bible. It's called the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. The Old Testament, the New Testament. Period. But dispensations, the, uh, the pre trib rapture and Zionism, building the kingdom of the Antichrist, um, those three things always go together. And yes, I went to a Baptist Bible college. I know this stuff inside and out which is why I don't use those big fancy theological words to try to impress anybody because I'm not trying to impress anybody. Either you believe me or you don't. I mean, I don't claim to be a prophet. I don't claim to know it all. But what I do know, I try to share, you know. And you got to realize this is a nonprofit ministry. I mean, I buy my own computers. I buy my own microphones. This comes out of my own time. You know, nobody pays me. I don't have a church that pays me to do this stuff. All right. I mean, I'm a volunteer, which means I'm unpaid. If I was a professional, like when I drove a truck and I had a commercial driver's license, a CDL, I was a professional truck driver. Somebody paid me to do my job. That made me a professional. You know, it's like uh, you could be a musician but if you're a professional musician like Elvis Presley or the Beatles or uh, Britney Spears or whatever, you know, somebody pays you to perform. Well, when it comes to the Bible stuff, I'm a volunteer. Nobody pays me. And just remember something. You get what you pay for, right? Yeah. All right. First Samuel chapter 2. And Hannah prayed. So here it is, Hannah, Hannah's request for a, a child was granted of the Lord. And she dedicated the child to the Lord. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. Mine horn is exalted in the Lord. Wait a minute. Is Hannah a rhinoceros? No. Is Hannah a, a ram or a goat? No. So this is a figure of speech. So, hmm, very interesting. Well, this will make more sense as we go on. I don't want to go into explaining it now, but when I get further down into the study, it'll make sense. My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. Mine horn is exalted. What is exalted? It means to be lifted up. Mine horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies because I rejoice in thy salvation. There is none holy as the Lord. Therefore, there is none beside thee. Neither is there any rock like our God. Hmm. A rock. Guess what? I did a Bible study on the rock. Paul said that rock was Christ. Why don't people believe Paul? I, I don't get it. Yeah, I know people abuse Paul's writings. I understand that. And they turn grace into a license to sin. Well, it's not Paul. It's the devils that are misusing Paul. I once had a minister that I respected. He says, you can make the Bible say anything you want if you pull verses out of context. And he used this as an example like the Jehovah's Witnesses do. Bible verse number one. Judas hung himself. Bible verse number two. Do thou likewise. Bible verse number three, what thou doest, do quickly. 
Does the Bible teach that we should hang ourselves and commit suicide? No. It's called pulling verses out of context. That's why I sometimes I'll read an entire chapter instead of just a couple of verses. So people cannot, well, they can, they can accuse me of uh, taking things out of context, but guess what? To anybody that's read along with me or, you know, knows the material, uh, they'll know it's a false accusation. So, Paul says that that rock was Christ. You know, the rock that followed uh, Moses in the wilderness when they came out of uh, Egypt. Moses struck the rock and it gave water. Oh, yeah. Neither is there any rock like our God. Talk no more so exceeding proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge. Oh yeah, God's a God of knowledge. And by him actions are weighed. Do you know that even if you're saved, your actions are going to determine your place in the kingdom. Are you going to be a ruler over a city? Or are you going to street, uh, sweep the streets of that city? Well, I don't know if they're going to have street sweepers or garbage men in the kingdom. I don't know. You know, but I'm just saying. And by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty men are broken. Well, these are the evil people. And they that stumbled are girded with strength. They that were full have hired out themselves for bread. And they that were hungry ceased, so that the barren hath borne seven. You know, a woman that couldn't have children, she had seven. And she that hath many children is waxed feeble. The Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. Oh, yeah. The Lord can kill, the Lord can make alive. Uh, there's There were resurrections in the Old Testament, believe it or not. Uh, what was it, Elias? Elias, E-L-I-A-S, did a, uh, a resurrection. Oh, yeah. Jesus did resurrection. Who was uh, Lazarus? The Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. Yeah, the Lord made me poor. I'm not poor. I'm not rich, but I'm not poor. I've been poor in my life. Believe it or not, I've been homeless before. Yeah. Yeah, I went to Tennessee to, to be a part of a Baptist church that I thought was pretty decent. I liked a couple of the sermons the pastor did. Boy, they loved me when I was tithing, uh, driving a truck, making a little bit of money. Boy, they loved me. I was the greatest thing since sliced bread. But when I was working and my back gave out and I couldn't drive a truck anymore and the truck wouldn't, the trucking company wouldn't give me a dime, you know, they, they wouldn't pay me any disability or anything. Middle of winter. Here it is. I'm, I can't work. I'm unemployed. I got no money coming in. What did the church do? Oh, I'm sorry. My house is crowded. You, you can't stay here. So I slept in my truck in the winter. Yeah. Yeah. Boy, the Lord, Lord gave me an education. So I learned, the Lord showed me, oh yeah. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low and lifteth up. He raiseth up the poor out of the earth and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes and to make them inherit, inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he has set the world upon them. He will keep the feet of his saints, and the wicked shall be silent in darkness. The wicked shall be silent in darkness, for by strength shall no man prevail. Verse 10. 
the adversaries. What's an adversary? That's an enemy. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king. Who's the king? King of kings, Lord of lords? If you don't know, that's Jesus. Oh, yeah. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king, and shall exalt the horn of his anointed. Huh. What does anointed mean? All right, let's take a look. Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Like I say, Webster was a believer. His definitions of words are, he makes reference to Bible usages of the same word in his dictionary. Oh, yeah. And he was a language scholar, which is called a linguist. Guy knew over 20 languages fluently. You know, he, he did the dictionary as a labor of love. He didn't even, from what I understand, he didn't even make much money on the dictionary. Uh, the guy spent like 20-something years doing this dictionary. You ought to read his uh, putting together this dictionary. I mean, amazing. Webster's 1828. Not this modern-day Webster's bull garbage, bull dung. You could say BS, you know. That would be the modern application. But uh, anoint, verb, transitive, it's Latin. To pour oil upon, to smear or rub over with oil, also to spread over as oil. We say the man anoints another or the oil anoints him. To consecrate by unction or the use of oil. What is to consecrate something? Uh, it means to set something apart. Just like uh, Samuel was consecrated, he was set apart for the Lord's work. Then he references Exodus 29 and verse 7. Thou shalt anoint the altar and sanctify it. Oh, okay. To smear a daub, he, um, and then in John 9 and verse 6, he, Jesus, anointed the eyes of the blind man with clay. Hmm, and then the blind man could see. But the Pharisees who had vision were blind, spiritually speaking. To prepare an allusion to the consecrating use of oil. Anoint the shield, Isaiah 21 and verse 5. To anoint the head with oil, Psalms 23 verse 5. Seems to signify to communicate the consolations of the Holy Spirit. There you go. The use of oil in consecrations was of high antiquity. Kings, prophets, and priests were set apart or consecrated to their offices by the use of oil, hence the peculiar application of the term anointed to Jesus Christ. This is, this is straight from the, the Webster's 1828 Dictionary, people. I'm not even adding anything to this. The guy was a believer. He used uh, Exodus 29, John 9, Isaiah 21, and Psalms 23 as references. You know... It, when the power goes out, you, you, you're going to want an, a, 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 a Webster's 1828 dictionary. Matter of fact, I need, to, I need to buy one. I really do. Uh, so, all right, let's go back to, uh, let's see. Let's read 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 10 again. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king, and exalt the horn of his anointed. 
See, the prophets of old, when they were going to anoint a king, they would take a horn, fill it with oil, and then put it on the head of the king, the future king, the, the king that was being anointed. Uh, Samuel did that to King David. Oh, yeah. So, if you want to, you can keep reading. But um, I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to stop right here. Uh, I'm going to read Exodus 19, or at least part of it. All right, so Moses took children of Israel out of Egypt. All right, verse 1. In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. How do you spell Sinai? S-I-N. Sin. A-I. Sin. A-I. Artificial intelligence. I'm kidding. But Sinai. Sin. S-I-N. For they were departed from Rephidim and were come to the desert of Sinai and had pitched in the wilderness and there Israel camped before the mount, the mountain. And Moses went up unto God and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob and tell the children of Israel. Now remember, Jacob's name was changed by the Lord to Israel. Verse 4. Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians. Oh, yeah. You don't know about the Passover, the plague of locusts, the plague of darkness, the hail with the blood mingled with fire. I mean, Egypt was destroyed. Oh, yeah. And guess what? The plagues of Revelation are very, very similar in some ways to the plagues that God destroyed Egypt with. The, the water turned to blood where they couldn't drink the water. The, the plague of the flies, the plague of the frogs. I did a playlist on that if anybody's interested. Um, Egypt, plagues compared to Revelation's plagues, uh, compared and contrasted. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, I got 1,500 Bible plus Bible studies. Send me a USB drive. I'll be happy to, to give you everything. I don't care. I don't copyright anything. But if you do, please give me a 128 gig drive. Make sure it's a fast one. Somebody gave me a, a drive and it was so slow. It took two and a half hours to copy everything. Which I work with it, you know. I can start copying and go shopping or whatever I got to do. Go to the grocery and come back and and it's still working. But if you give me a fast drive, I could be done in 30 minutes or less. So, you know, come on, give me a break. Spend the extra couple bucks. Give me a break, you know, come on. All right, verse four. Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles wings and brought you unto myself uh did the lord land a, an eagle with its wings and everybody climbed on the eagle and its wings and then the w thing flew off no it's a figure of speech people and if you read revelation 12 where it talks about the church going into the wilderness it mentions eagles wings Oh, but Chaplain Bob, I'm a New Testament Christian. Uh, I, I've never read the Old Testament, and, and, and I read Revelation, and it don't make no sense to me. Of course not, because all the symbolism comes from the Old Testament. Sheesh. Come on, get with the program. You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians. Yeah. Yeah, the plague of flies and locusts and frogs and darkness and hail. Oh, yeah. And how I bear you, Israel, on eagle's wings and brought you unto myself. Listen to this. Now, therefore, 
if, a big if, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant. You know, when you hear people say, well, the Jews have an everlasting covenant with God. Well, they might have had one, but God says, if ye will obey and keep my covenant. But the thing is, they didn't. They broke the covenant. If ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Wait a minute. You mean God's God's being God's being racist here. He's going to a peculiar treasure above all people? What? But God loves everybody equally. So they tell us. For all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. Well, the Canaanites were not a holy nation. They were an unholy nation. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord hath spoken we will do. Liar, liar, pants on fire. And the people said, All that the Lord hath spoken we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with thee, and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes. Well, guess what, people? God wants the people to be set apart, and this washing of the clothes is a foreshadow of being baptized in the future. Remember? It, basically, they're washing their clothes, but John the Baptist, he was washing their flesh, which was symbolic for the washing away of sins. But they're washing their clothes. But what happens in the book of Revelation? The Lord gives us white robes washed in his blood for a covering for sin, the washing away of sin. People, the, the Bible makes so much sense. All you got to do is read it. You know, read read James chapter 1. It says, if any of you lack understanding, understanding, let him ask of the Lord. Ask the Lord for understanding. Read the book. You know, I was told in college that you, like if you take a class, you'll get out of it what you put in it. And that's true. And that's true. Go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes and be ready again against the third day. For the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. And thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about, saying, Take heed to yourselves that ye go not up into the mount or touch the border of it. Whosoever toucheth the mount shall be surely put to death. Don't touch that holy mountain with your sinful flesh. You'll die. Oh, yeah. Verse 13. There shall not an hand touch it, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through, whether it be beast or man. Is that a four-legged beast or a two-legged beast? It shall not live. When the trumpet soundeth long, they shall come up to the mount. So when the ram's horn is blown, the trumpet, do to do Soundeth long. It's a call to action. Come to the mount. 
You know, you're being called to do something. And Moses went down from the mount unto the people and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. And he said unto the people, Be ready against the third day. Come not at your wives. Come not at your wives. Don't you be having marital relations. Uh-uh. Makes you wonder why. What was that sin in the garden? Hmm. Makes you wonder. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. They were scared, people. Verse 17. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God and they stood at the nether part of the mount and Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Fire. Isn't the earth going to be destroyed in fire? Oh, yeah. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. You know, this is like, this, is, this kind of language reminds me of Revelation. Fire, smoke. Uh, the bottomless pit's going to open up and the, the beast's going to ascend and the smoke's going to come up. And there's going to be an earthquake that's going to shake the whole earth and the mountains and are going to be flattened and the islands are going to disappear. That's in the book of Revelation. Well, gee, Chaplain Bob, I never read the Old Testament. Well, you should. It makes sense. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mount, and the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mount, and Moses went up. Everybody else is scared, and, and Moses is going up on the mount. 21, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go down, charge the people, lest they break through unto the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. Uh, go tell the people and give them a charge, a commandment, you know. Uh, you ever heard of being charged with a crime? You know, go down there, charge them. Because if they break through the barriers and, you know, they want to see what's going on and they touch them out, they're dead. I want to kill them. And let the priests also which come near to the Lord sanctify themselves, lest the Lord break forth upon them. And Moses said unto the Lord, The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for thou chargest us, saying, Set bounds about the mount, and sanctify it. And the Lord said unto him, Away, get thee down, and thou shalt come up, thou and Aaron with thee. But let not the priests and the people break through to come up unto, upon, unto the Lord, lest he break forth upon them. So Moses went down unto the people and spake unto them. And... You know, should actually keep reading all this stuff, but you know. So, the trump, the trumpet. You know, there you go. So, the horn. And we read about Hannah, who had Samuel the prophet talking about the horn of salvation. Oh, yeah. We're going to read about that. That'll probably be the closing thing. Um, that'll probably be the closing verse because it's in the New Testament. Speaking about, guess who? And no, not Randy Bachman and American Woman in These Eyes. And yeah, not, no, not that guess who. No. Boy, I'm old, aren't I? Yeah. Sheesh. Anyways. All right, well, we're going to continue this. Uh, today's December 8th, 2022, God willing. So this is going to be part one. And boy, I haven't even covered hardly anything, it seems like. But this is uh, symbolism in the Bible. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' precious name, amen.